This is Charlie. Uh, Carol's in Sweden. I'm just joking. <laughs> She'll be here in a second. If that's the Carol you're No, it's a, di it's, a not, it's a different Carol. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. But we'll be glad when Carol joins us. <laughs> no, okay. Good morning and welcome to the Sunday service of Summit Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. My name is Joni Mountain and I'm the service associate today. We're recording the service and we will turn it off for the community gathering. If you have difficulties hearing, <clears throat> there is a way to enable closed captioning. It is different on different devices, but generally it can be found at the bottom of your screen. There's a couple of options. There's a box that says live transcript uh, and a CC. And you can either uh, enable the show subtitles and it'll be like when you watch closed captioning on TV and you can move that box around or you can view the full transcript. Today's service has been planned by Summit Social Justice and Action Committee. And the speaker today is Wanjiru Warama. Wanjiru grew up on a British colonial farm in Kenya. She moved to the United States to earn degrees in business administration and worked as a real estate professional for 25 years. <clears throat> in 2014, she gave up her broker's license to concentrate on writing. Since then, she has published five books. You can find her online and her address is, it will be in the chat. Wanjiro lives in La Mesa and is a member of Summit. So welcome Wanjiro. And now let us begin to enter the spirit of worship and turn our hearts and minds to the music of the prelude. Composer John Field was born in 1782. Um, this was, you know, good thir almost 30 years before Chopin, and he really pioneered the idea of writing pieces that weren't just sonatas and sonatinas. And this is a nocturne, a night piece, you know, written well before Chopin wrote his and lovely um, music from this Irish composer.
Thank you, Barbara. <clears throat> Welcome again to the Sunday morning worship service of Summit Unitarian Fellowship. We are a liberal religious community bound together by shared principles drawn from world religions, humanist teachings, nature and science, philosophy and personal practices. We are a religion of love and inclusion. We aspire to the principles and purposes that are listed in the order of service. The mission of Summit is to commit ourselves to building a more compassionate, just, and sustainable world. If you're new to the Unitarian Universalism or to Summit and would like to know more about us, we invite you to go to our website, summituuf.org, click on the visitors button, and fill out an online connection card. Someone will follow up with you. We want to acknowledge that our fellowship resides on unceded Kumeyaay land, and that for more than 10,000 years, this land has been and continues to be home to the Kumeyaay people. We recognize the violent history of the colonization of California and honor the legacy and continuing presence of the Kumeyaay Nation. We have several announcements and testimonials this morning, and we will start with Serafina Galante. Good morning. I'd like to talk about the uh, coming home party at Summit. We're gathering next week on Saturday the 26th between 11 and 2 p.m. We're celebrating our coming home and the start of our pledge campaign. So a few things we wanted everyone to know about. Um, lunch and beverage are provided, but I've been asked to make it clear that no caffeine will be there because somebody, uh, some people rely on that. So um, if you would RSVP, please, it'll really help us to be sure that there's enough food and that we don't run out. Um, would hate for people to be coming and we'd be short. So please RSVP before Wednesday, the 24th. Uh, carpool if you can, as half the, car, uh, half the parking lot will be taken up uh, with our event. So carpooling is really great if you can do it or uh, just be prepared to walk a little distance perhaps. Part of our covenant of care is respecting each other's wishes around social distancing and physical contact. So uh, to that end, we've set up a communication system, kind of like traffic signals. There are red, yellow, and green round stickers that will be available. And what you do is put one on your uh, name badge which will also be available. So red means a stop, please distance, keep distance between us. Yellow means proceed with caution, ask before getting too close or shaking hands. And green, I'm okay with handshakes, but still might be best to ask about hugs. About masks, Masks will be available along with hand sanitizer and hand wipes. Masks are optional outdoors. However, they are required if you go indoors. So if you go inside, please do wear a mask. And of course, the pledge area will be set up with forms and members available to answer questions, assist in any way, and naturally, of course, accept your signed form. If you have questions, please do contact me. I'll put my information in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Serafina. Uh, Barbara? Hi, here is my testimonial. And I'd like to begin with the disclosure that I am a member of First UU Church and, and am also a pledging friend of Summit. What I get from Summit is what the best friendships have to offer. A support system to share my joys 
and to provide sincere sympathy when things get tough. A true friend will call you out when you get too full of yourself or too mired in petty arguments and help you get back to being your best self. Summit makes me think more deeply about the greater questions of how to live a decent life and reminds me that together we, you use, can make a big difference in the world. What impresses me deeply about Summit is there is a feeling that perhaps due to Summit's being a small congregation, that everyone's full participation is needed in all the facets of congregational life. And that showing up to services, which of course has been online for the past two years is just one piece of Unitarian Universalist identity. We also are expected to vote. We are expected to encourage others to vote. We are expected to stand up for human rights, to speak to each other respectfully, to question and to give of our talents and time. Even though my relationship with Summit is that of a friend, I feel deeply committed to this friendship and feel that I have an ethical responsibility to pledge my financial support to a community that does so much to enrich my life. And I'd like to suggest that regardless of your membership status, that you evaluate the worth of Summit as it relates to your ability to live your best and most honest and most joyful life. Thank you, Barbara. <clears throat> Carol? Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Carol Schaubelt. Uh, so when Josh asked me to talk about why I pledge, um, I thought a lot about it. And I'm kind of a private person, but I'm going to speak from the heart. So what first brought me to Summit was a pretty devastating disease diagnosis. I have a muscle disease and it's very rare and there's no treatment or cure, but thankfully it progresses slowly, but it progresses nonetheless. Um, and I used to be a really active sporty person. So that diagnosis kind of rocked me. So that's what first brought me to Summit. Um, I had deep questions. Um, when I came about the existence of a higher power and how to live a good life and how to face decline and death with grace. I needed bolstering. I needed to build my inner strength and Summit does that for me. And when I attend service every Sunday, I kind of reflect on the week and usually something, the music, the poetry, the stories, I find a little something somewhere every week that kind of bolsters me. And that's why I give to Summit. Um, I know how important a regular monthly pledge is because it's money that our fellowship can count on. I think gifts are nice, but I know it helps our finance committee to plan for the year and to pay our staff and kind of know what come, what's coming. And I think a monthly pledge makes Summit more secure. Um, when I pledge, I think about Summit's future and its legacy. And all the kids that are in RE now, I want them to um, become teenagers here and grow up here. And um, I want Summit still standing. Um, I want it to be a busy, vibrant place offering music and classes and support for both longtime members and uh, people who kind of stumble in. And I think a pledge uh, helps ensure that. And most of all, in this kind of crazy, chaotic world full of war and disease, um, I need to be around the people at Summit, um, caring, kind people, smart people, um, curious people, giving people. And the good people at Summit uh, help me feel better about the world. So um, Michael J. Fox, he's an actor who has Parkinson's disease. He has said that if you can find something to be grateful for every day, 
optimism can be sustained. And Summit helps me sustain my optimism. So thanks for listening and please give as best you can. Thank you, Carol. Eleanor? Good morning. I am Eleanor Weed, current president of the board directors. And we are so looking forward to the kickoff of our pledge drive next week and seeing you in person, even if it's just in our summit parking lot. If you have not already done so, please RSVP today. The link is both in your virtual and PDF order of service emails that you received. Later today, I will be sending out some information that will be about this year's pledge drive. I wanna let you know that the pledges will be for next year's budget, which runs from July of this year through June of next year. One of the documents I will be sending you looks like this. It's called, How Much Is My Fair Share? Please read it over and find the color that best describes your family. This will help you find the best range for your pledge. Think about it, talk about it, talk it over with your family and be ready to fill out your pledge form next weekend. For those of you who will not be joining us in person, we will be sending out the pledge form to you next weekend. Whether near or far, we are so glad that you are part of Summit's family and that we hope you can help us continue our work, the work of our fellowship next year and beyond. Just to let you know, you will be indicating two amounts on your pledge form next weekend. One is for the annual operating budget of Summit, and it will go here. And the other is the portion that you would like to donate that will go to the Unitarian Universalist Association's annual program fund. This is a line item in our budget, and the amount of that line item for next year's budget will be the total of the donations that are identified. So please consider giving a gift to that as well. And I can't look, can't wait to see you all next weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eleanor. <clears throat> We're so glad all of you have chosen to join us this morning for a time of connection and reflection. I invite you to stay after the service for our community gathering where we'll have a chance to talk with Wanjiru, or if you would like to share a joy or concern with the larger group. And now as we get ready to light our chalice, if you have a candle or a chalice at home, please uh, light it with us. Mary will light it, the chalice in the sanctuary and Rin will say the chalice lighting words. Thank you, Joni. We light our chalice this morning with the words of David Brooks. Happiness tends to be individual. We measure it by asking, are you happy? Joy tends to be self-transcending. Happiness is something you pursue. Joy is something that rises up unexpectedly and sweeps over you. Happiness comes from accomplishments. Joy comes from offering gifts. Happiness fades. We get used to the things that used to make us happy. Joy doesn't fade. To live with joy is to live with wonder, gratitude, and hope. Speranza fe amor, verda mi viesa cantando, de cada tierra, cada voz. From all who dwell below the skies, let faith and hope with love. Tree.
please join in the UU aspiration while muted. May love be the spirit of this fellowship. May the quest for truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our aspiration. And now Mary Carter Vale will do a time for all ages. Good morning. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Today, I want to share with you something that I learned when I was um, a teenager. It's called the Sanki. And I have several of these eggs that I've made. This is a Ukrainian egg decorating batik style. And I've got several different eggs here to show you. I made all of these or my children made some of them over the years. Um, but this is such a cool technique and I wanted to share it with you because it's part of my family heritage story, at least sort of. So these eggs start with a real raw egg. This is a raw egg, sort of like this one. This one's blown out, this one is not. The traditional craft was done with a whole egg and it predates Christianity. So probably before the Eastern European region, the Ukrainian region even had that name. This, this was a very, very old, old craft that was done with plant dyes, beeswax, and raw eggs. And the egg is a symbol of spring and rebirth and fertility. And it is now used as a Christian symbol in that culture as well. And this craft has spread beyond the Ukrainian borders. It's all over that Eastern European area. Um, uh, and the reason I share this craft with you today is part of my family came from that area. My closest immigrant family to this country is my great, great grandfather and grandmother who came over separately from the Austrian Hungarian empire as pre-World War I refugees. They, were, they left and came to this country where they met in New York City and fell in love. I don't know much about that history because they sort of hid a lot of it, but I've gotten some clues that I'm gonna share with you today. Before that though, I wanna show you a little bit more about this egg. So these start as a white egg and you draw on them with beeswax. So these lines are beeswax. And this is a tool called a kiska. And what it is, it's a little funnel. This is a high tech one. Here's a low tech one that was made with a little piece of foil just bent to hold the wax. And you heat this kiska on a candle until the wax melts. And then you can paint with it over the areas that you want to stay in the color you currently have. So right now this is white, a yellow. So everywhere I put this dye, a yellow line will remain. I'm not the straightest doing this while talking. So you can see I'm making little points here. This egg, will eventually become something like this. It's hard to see it right now. So I would cover every place with wax that I wanted to remain yellow, and then I dip it in the next dye color, which in this case would be an orange. And you work from your lightest colors to your darkest colors, ending with black. So when my grandparents came over to this country and they met in New York City, like I said, and this was before World War I, and the story is that my grandfather fled where he lived with his family because all his brothers had been killed and his family sent him here for safety. So he was a refugee of um, a situation that he came from. We don't know exactly where, what border or what country he came from other than the name Austria and the name Poland were both in the family history in stories that were told. But the biggest story was we're Americans now, we don't talk about where we came from, which was really difficult as a family, when you wanna understand what your heritage is and, and wh who are the people you come from. So when my grandmother was dying, she had cancer. My mom was with her and there was a time when she kind of went sort of childlike in hospice care and on pain meds and was telling stories that we'd never heard before. Um, she had always talked about her father. Oh, I forgot, her father passed away when she was very young, he died. At, from um, damage done to his body through the pandemic of the 
1918 through 1920s. He died in 1920. So she was just had a little time with him and was spent most of her life without a dad. So, but her dad became this wonderful romantic figure in her life, somebody she really treasured. And he, um, she always said he was like the Von Trapp family where he fled out of Eastern Europe to protect his family. Um, I always kind of visioned him more like Tevya and Fiddler on the Roof because he was a violin player and he taught her the violin, which she played with great pride her entire life. And when she was dying, my mom asked her, you know, tell us about your family life because we were trying to figure out what are the clues of our heritage? Where do we come from? And she described a family Sabbath of Friday night when every, everybody would be quiet and they would settle down, they would have their dinner, they would light their candles, and there would be this beautiful time of reflection until Saturday evening when the, viol when the sun set, violins came out and music instruments came out and everybody played music together. And it was sounded very much like the European, Eastern European Jewish tradition. So we think that our family, that side of the family is Jewish heritage, which I thought was very, very interesting to discover. Um, we don't know for sure. Some of these things are mysteries, but the, with, the immigrate, with the immigrants coming over and my family coming over brought with them traditions like the violin playing. And when I discovered the Ukrainian egg tradition as a teenager, I fell in love with this right away. And I showed it to my grandmother. She fell in love with it. And it was something that we kind of had a little bond over. And then I taught it to my children as well. I don't know if I have Ukrainian heritage. I know I have Eastern European heritage. And this is one of the ways that I connect with that. So this is one of the eggs that I did. And it's, it's I don't know if you can see, but the wax is covering a whole bunch of the egg. And after you do the coloring and the dipping and the coloring and the dipping, you take your egg and you, again, low tech, you heat it on the candle and you watch that wax melt. People also do this in the oven. They do it in different ways. This is just the way that I like to do it. And then you wipe that wax off and color starts to appear. The, this, all the color that is showing up is what I hid with the wax when I was doing the different dyeing techniques of these eggs. And I found out that yesterday at the House of Ukraine in Balboa Park, they actually had a, their annual Vysansky teaching class where they teach how to do this technique. We might do an egg dyeing activity next month in the parking lot for all ages, for everybody. And I will bring these tools if you wanna give this a try. So as you can see, I'm wiping this wax off. One more wipe, you can kind of see the image. See, you can start to see I've made a little chalice here. I will keep working on this. And when we do our egg um, extravaganza in the parking lot next month, ha, 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 you can come and see the eggs and maybe try making one yourself. Now these, one of the things of the Ukrainian eggs is they were different and unique for each family. Each family had a special design that they did. And the designs were symbols of what was important to them. This one has wheat on it. Many of the folks in that area were farmers um, and still are farmers. So as I do this craft, I think of my family and I think of the, the Ukrainian people and all the Eastern Europe, European people. And I encourage you to talk to the elders in your family, talk to your grandparents, your great grandparents, your parents, whoever the elders are, and ask them for your family stories. We all have them. And it's real important to figure them out and to know them because it helps us to know where we have come from and continue to take that on as we go. So thank you for listening today. Tyler, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. 
Yes, I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. You used to rock me in the cradle of your arms. You said you'd hold me till the pains of life were gone. You said you'd comfort me in times like these and now I need memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. Since you've gone and left me, there's been so little beauty, but I know I saw clearly through your eyes. Now the world outside is such a cold and bitter place. Here inside I have few things that will console. I try to hear your voice above the storms of life, then I remember that I was told. Yes, I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. Yes, I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. I think all the things that made me feel so wonderful when I was young. I think all the things that made me laugh, made me dance, made me sing. I think all the things that made me grow into a being full of pride. I think on these things. Sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. I thought that you were gone, but now I know you're with me. You are the voice that whispers all I need to hear. I know a please, a thank you, and a smile will take me far. I know that I am you. I know that who I am is numbered in each grain of sand. I know that I've been blessed again and over again and again and again. Yes, I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. Yes, I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own Our meditation this morning is from John Beersdorf. Compassion is expressed in gentleness. When I think of pe persons I know who model for me the depths of spiritual life, I am struck by their gentleness. Their eyes communicate the residue of solitary battles with angels, the costs of caring for others, the deaths of ambition and ego and the peace that comes from having very little left to lose in this life. They are gentle because they have honestly faced the struggles given to them and have learned the hard way that sur personal survival is not the point. Their vulnerability has been stretched to clear-eyed sensitivity to others and truly selfless love. We are a fellowship supported entirely by the voluntary generosity of our members and friends. And we greatly appreciate our faithful pledgers who continue to keep up their monthly contributions. If you are moved to contribute today, it's easier than ever. 
The link can be found in the chat box and it takes you directly to the donation location. And now we will greatly accept your generous donations during the musical interlude. We live on a small planet in a vast universe. This is the Space Suite, three movements from the Space Suite by Emma Lou Deemer. This one is entitled Billions of Stars. The Rings of Saturn. And finally, dance in the light year. Thank you, Barbara. And now Wanjiru. Wanjiru, you're muted. Okay, I'll start again. Unmute. My name is Wanjiru Warama, and it's an honor to speak before you today. Let's start with, uh, before we get to the reflections, let's start with uh, a bit of African geography for those who are not familiar with Africa. The African continent is, has a population of 1.3 billion people and counting, spread over 54 sovereign countries, according to United Nations. And Kenya, the country I was born and raised, 
is one of those countries. Kenya is uh, on the eastern side of the continent by the Indian Ocean. It has, it's slightly larger than twice the size of Nevada. It has a population of 55 million people and 42 distinct tribes. I'm from the Gikoyu tribe, also known as Kikuyu in Kiswahili. And that's as far as you can get from the summit. I came to San Diego in 1984. And uh, as the years rolled by, and then decades, I never heard of the summit until a fellow Rotarian invited me to a fundraiser in March of 2019. So I can say without a doubt that Alexandria Hart, also known as Alexi, is responsible for me being here today. And the other person who played a very big role in my being, me being here was born at the end of 19th century, about 130 years ago, in a place called Nyeri County overlooking Mount Kenya. He, when he was a little boy, he saw the British invade and devastate his community. As if that were not enough, his father died when he was 12 years old. But by then, he knew the ways of his people, the father had taught him, and he also knew how they worshiped. To the Gekoyo nation, which were designated as tribe after the British occupation, Guy or God has no form, has no gender, is invisible, and lives in the heavens. Mount Kenya or any high mountain is Guy's ugly home. And the Kikuyu or Gekoyo, I'll use the word Gekoyo because that's the authentic uh, name to the tribe. So the Gekoyo worshiped before under a tree, a big tree to signify a mountain. They also prayed facing Mount Kenya. And they believed that the places of worship should be created by nature, not by human hand. So that, that's the reason why they never built houses of worship. And uh, in the creation they believed in, the Koyo believed, and some still believe that Guy created the first man, Gikoyo, and that's what the tribe is named after on Mount Kenya, and later created his wife, Mombi. To this day, the tribe fondly refers to itself as the children of Gikoyo and Mombi, or simply the children of Mombi. When Guy released the couple from Mount Kenya, Guy spelled out the boundaries of Gikuyu country and also told them where they needed to settle. They settled at a place known as Mokorowa Nyagadanga in Muranga County. And to this day, that's a holy shrine for the Kikuyu people. I visited the site in December of 2015. And because the Kikuyu had no doomsday or hell or heaven, they believed when people died, they joined the ancestors in the spirit world. This made foreign historians and missionaries believe that Gikoyo people worshiped their ancestors. 
to this end, missionaries through religious schools and with the help of the colonial government, waged an all out war to wipe out what they termed as ancestral worship or paganism. And uh, almost every aspect of the natives' lives. And by then, the boy, when the boy's father died, they had such a religious school in his community where they took such boys, orphans. The boy refused to go because he didn't trust them and he didn't want to be taught the things they were teaching them. But somehow the boy grew up, he married, and he and his wife brought forth three children, two boys and a girl. By then the colonial government had devastated him so much or jacked him so much, including drafting to World War I, including his younger brother. And all he wanted with his family, he wanted to get a job where he could earn money to pay government taxes and find a refuge for him and his family. He joined a caravan of job seekers and left his family behind. Something like the caravans we hear on the southern border of the United States. They went farm to farm looking for jobs. The men added up in a farm in Nakuru County in the Great Rift Valley. It's unknown how long he stayed before he got on his feet to go back for his family. But when he went back, he found a fourth child, a born a son. And that started the quarrel that would finally doom their couple's marriage. But they battled their, their, their four children now. They returned back to the farm. For the next 10 years, they worked on the farm. They raised their family and they quarreled. In another, I think about two years, maybe it was about 12 years, the man decided to insulate himself from his first marriage to marry a much younger woman. And in another 10 years, that much younger woman brought forth a daughter they named Wanjiro after the mother, the man's mother. After one year, my father divorced his first wife, thereby denying me the experience of growing up in a polygamous family. So I lived in that secluded home until I was age six. By then I knew my people came from the Gikuyu and Mombi. And I also knew our clan, Anjiro. I had also noticed my father had a shrine, a wooden shrine, the size of about uh, a big doll. It was by the barn, but I didn't know what was inside or what he did with it. But I knew he did manly things because as I would learn later, men did all the worship stuff. And again, I still at that age, I knew the family did not bother my father's stuff. The other thing I did, I felt special that I was named after my paternal grandmother. And especially because the name Wanjiro was the name of the Gekoyo and Mombi, the first daughter of Gekoyo and Mombi. So uh, essentially the first daughter of the nation. Somehow I felt special and even thought my father favored me because of that. And then our lives changed. Men known as Gekoyo men, known as the Mau Mau freedom fighters took arms to fight the British. The colonial government declared a state of emergency the whole, in the whole country. 
and immobilize every Gekoyo man, woman, and child and put them into what they call the native reserves, something similar like the Native American reservations, only smaller. Others they took to concentration or detention camps. But the farms had to keep on running to feed their population and for exports. So the British farmers cherry picked the families that will remain on the farm. And uh, they had to sign a loyalty agreement that no matter what happened, they will remain on the farm, they will be loyal, and they will defend the farm. They also, the government took them for a week. They took men and women for a week's intensive police interrogation, which included a lot of abuse and torture to make sure they were not members of the Mau Mau. Then after that, we moved to a secluded village, a fenced off village, what they called protective villages about a mile from the farmer's residence. So by then there were curfews from dusk to dawn. People could not go anywhere without written permission of the owner. So people just stayed. You had to work on the farm and just stay there, even if it's going to the, hosp to the hospital. By age, between age eight and nine, Christianity swept through our village. And we used to say like a hurricane. But I understood that if people became Christians, and I heard this because people are talking, and they were treated better. Women converted, or they were born again. And so there was a lot of activity in the village but I didn't know what it all meant. Until my mother woke up one morning and she declared she had an awakening. According to her, Jesus visited her at night and told her to repent her sins and all would be forgiven. She changed her wardrobe. She started wearing scarves as a sign of a veil. And she basically, almost changed overnight. And my, my father was not happy about that. There are other families that went through much uh, worse things than what we did in my family. So for a time, my father and my mother, they were at loggerheads or they were almost not in speaking terms. In about two months, my father could not take it because according to him, my mother had taken over his family. One day he drank one, on a Sunday, he drank and I started drinking at about 10 a.m. I had never seen my father drink in the morning ever. Uh, by lunchtime, when my mother came from lunch, you no, know, from church, she hurried herself to make uh, lunch for us. And my mother, at attacked her when she was coming from the barn. He struggled to slap and rest her to the ground. And my, I was with my three younger siblings and I watched my parents struggle. I had never seen them do that. And something, something clicked in me. And I realized if it wasn't for Christianity, my parents would never fight. Anyway, fortunately for my mother, a drunk, uh, an old drunk is no, is no match for a much younger sober wife. So his slaps and grabs and complains that uh, his home had been taken over amounted to nothing. If he continued, he was the one who would end up on the ground. So he gave up the fight. But he went indoors and he broke her dishes. Anyway, that was the end of my parents' fight. And from then on, 
my parents led different lives, separate lives, as far as religion was concerned. My father stuck to his tradition methods, including the shrine that Hari appeared at the village. And my mother became a stout Christian and went to church on Sundays. When I started school, that's when I started, uh, I realized Christianity was also a part of the school. It was just like a curriculum. But by then, like they say, formative years are very important. I already knew all this history about my, my people. So we learned about the 10 commandments, all the many things we learned, I didn't do them. So I didn't understand about burning in hell or stuff like that. I couldn't even think three months ahead. So burning in hell was a very long time and I didn't know when. So by the time, and they talked about things like smoking or drinking. The other thing, I, I didn't mind drinking because I liked my father when he drank, except that one time. My father was approachable when he drank. I could ask him for anything. And if he promised, you give it to me. And he would never needed to be reminded. And also that's when he told us about our stories. So we actually liked him to drink. And uh, I couldn't agree with the other people when they said that it was a sin, when I realized the way I wanted my father to be. Anyway, by the time I reached grade four, actually before, I was tired of sins, being called a sinner, and talk, people talking about the burning in hell. As I went on, when I went to high school, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which side you are on, I joined a school a, a formerly segregated Indian school. The Indians had their temples outside campus. So school was just academics. So from then on, I never had anything to do with the church. Even when I, I moved to Nairobi after that, uh, church was not uh, in my life to the disappointment of my own mother. Even yeah, by the time I traveled here to San Diego, California, I came here in 19, I think I said that in 1984. Again, religion was not a part of my life. But uh, when I arrived in San Diego, as years went by, I hungered to belong to a community. Community not associated with school or with business. And by then I have learned about the politics in the US. So I knew where to go looking. So I visited several Baptist churches, but uh, I wasn't used to that kind of energetic mode of worship. So, and the other thing I didn't want to hear that I'm a sinner, one more time. So it didn't work out. And then at one time I attended the, was it the Church of the Sons, Church, yeah, or Religious Sons, yes, Church of Religious Sons in Bonita. I stuck there for three months and then I was gone. One time I lived in downtown San Diego I said, well, why don't I check out the science of Scientology? When I got there, the attendant to, went into pains to explain to me where I could find a black church. So then I let months or years go by. And then I thought, you know what? I don't know, I'm a, I was, by then I was describing myself as agnostic because really I don't know. Then I saw an ad about an atheist group in Hillcrest. I said, well, maybe that's what I have. 
that's what I am. Maybe that's what I really would like to be. I went to visit the group. They all gawked at me as if I missed my way to the bread line. And I gave up on houses of worship. And I said, well, if that's all there is, I'm good the way I am. Until Alexei invited me to that fundraiser I mentioned at the beginning. She could have told me to donate money, but instead she told me to come and sell my books and pay a percentage of the proceeds. When I got to the summit uh, on March 24th, 2019, I found members had already erected a canopy. They had displayed tables. They had even, they, they kind of put aside my table. All I needed to do was display my books. But then I learned that we are not going to have a sale until after the service. Oh, I, I regretted why I came so early. So I thought, well, I'll stay at the canopy until they come out. And I thought that was silly and ungracious. So I decided to wait in the sanctuary. I cannot tell you the details of what Reverend Frank talked about or said that day, maybe very few, but I can tell you what he didn't say. He didn't talk about sinners and burning in hell. He did not talk about righteous people or about heaven. And he did not talk about doomsday or what will happen after we die. He projected hope for humankind. He implied that we are all worthy and that each and every one of us has a part to play. And he talked about love, a love for each other. His someone touched my emotional center and left a sense of well-being within me. At home in the evening, I thought how nice it would be to belong to such a group. And the special thing is, the, or the kicker was, and some of you may forgive me for saying this, the kicker was, it wasn't a church. It was Unitarian Universalist Fellowship or simply summit. So I thought, you know what? I'll go and check it again. So I came back two or three times because the first time I thought it could be a fluke. They are not this good. So when, but when I came, members welcomed me as if I belonged. They even fed me fruits, cookies, a cake, and coffee. I came again and again and again. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anjiro. We're glad you found us.
from the rolling motion Still my dry land heart can say I've been sailing all my life now Never harbor or port have I known The wide universe is the ocean I travel And the earth is my blue Sun my sail and moon my rudder As I ply the starry sea Leaning over the edge in wonder Casting questions into the deep Drifting here with my ship's companions All we kindred pilgrim souls Making our way by the lights of the heavens In our beautiful blue boat home Give thanks to the waves upholding me Hail the great winds urging me on Greet the infinite sea before me Sing the sky my sailor song I was born upon the fathoms Never harbor or port have I known Wide universe is the ocean I travel And the earth is my blue boat home The wide universe is the ocean I travel And the earth is my blue I'm going to call it right now. I think. Thank you, Wanjiru. The closing words are from Reverend Dr. Natalie Maxwell Fenimore. We seek to be a home for all who desire our company. We seek to make a welcome for all those in search of our good news. Come, come, little children, teens, young adults, adults, and elders. Come families in great diversity, come to this loving home and safe harbor, but not to find a place to escape the world. This is a community of engagement and of creativity. We come together to create boldly, dangerously. We must create the beloved community with an awareness of how difficult it is because it is deep ministry. It is a ministry that challenges us to bring our whole selves and engage deeply and for the long haul. Our faith, our tradition must call us into community. Our task is to create spaces where we might know and value each other. Let us listen to our stories.
As we get close to uh, the end of our service and extinguishing our chalice, I invite you to stay afterwards for the community gathering and to come back next week for Reverend Everett Howe's coming home service. We extinguish our chalice with the words of, Re of Rabbi David Wolpe. Spiritual people may experience transcendence, but for most people, spirituality lasts and deepens only if it is lived out within that maddening community called institutional religion. Spirituality is an emotion. Religion is an obligation. Spirituality soothes. Religion mobilizes. Spirituality is satisfied with itself. Religion is dissatisfied with the world. Oh.